So welcome to Two Sisters Health. Um, I'm Rachel, and this I'm is Jen. Jen. <laughs> and we're interviewing Eric Christensen today. That's oh, great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for joining, joining us. us. So um, to give you a little background on us, we've been talking about health. I'm a physician assistant. I work in primary care, and my sister Jen is a researcher in sociology. And so we're kind of using our my medical background and her um, social, social background to talk okay. about where those intersect in health. And oh, that's great. Yeah. So we found you, um, and you're a documentary filmmaker that it's um, bridging kind of trauma and how that affects people. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? You know, it's interesting. You you mentioned the the filmmaker. I, I'm not sure if I'm too fond of the filmmaker title as more <laughs> of a messenger. It it really is more of a calling for me. Mm. And you know, it, I I got into this over 30 years ago when my home burned down in the Panic Cave fire disaster in Santa Barbara, and it was I, I was working in the industry since I've been really really young. And I was in the industry already, but um, after my home burned down, I thought it was very, very interesting that the survivors could really speak amongst themselves, but it was very difficult to communicate to the outside world about the experience of having gone through that trauma and that loss. And it, it is loss. It's a lot of it is grief. Yeah. And um, so from there, I decided naively to do my own documentary and uh, I did a film called faces in the fire about the survival of that um, fire and actually the ensuing recovery and uh, the hope and you know the all the hills and valleys of recovery after a trauma and that was my first film and that's how I got started over 30 years ago and I'm on my fourth film now but that film faces in the fire went on to win my first Emmy award then but more importantly, mm -hmm. it was picked up by the National Institute of Mental Health as a teaching tool oh. to practitioners that would come into disasters and they get local, they get local um, clinicians um, to help debrief disaster survivors. And it would be used to help them, uh, these, uh, these clinicians. It would be used to help them familiarize themselves with people and the the events and the different stages of um, recovery from uh, from a disaster. So that started me going, and and so now here I am on my fourth film. That's amazing. That who was it that identified your work as a possible uh, clinical tool like that? It was, was actually, it just some I, random it's person. So funny, I remember his name. His name was Arnie Shieldhouse. And he was a um, therapist from uh, the city mm -hmm. of Santa Barbara. And he recommended me to, now I'm forgetting the name of my connection at the National Institute of Mental Health. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up having, you know, a, quite a relationship with them for the next few years. And uh, that was very, very fulfilling. And I, I, I think it was almost 10 years ago, I got a letter saying that. You know, the film was still in their catalog. I, it, it's a, it's over 30 years old now, but yeah. So the experience of partnering with people to use your work as a clinical tool, did that sort of inform your future films as well? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. It, it means so much to me to be clinically grounded in my work. And so, yes, it, it definitely did. And not only that, there's it's kind of twofold. For my work, uh, it, it's it, it's very uh, it's very fulfilling to know that it's not only I hate to call it entertaining, but it's also clinically grounded. But the other side of that clinic, you know, that clinical side of things, it's also helpful. It, it is it it is a tool, and so to be of service with my work, and that's why I'm not just a filmmaker. It's more of a messenger or whatever it is. It's a calling that I have. It's very important that my work is of service, that it does something, but it also does it, you know, um, 
clinically correct. You know, it, it just uh, it, what I'm saying is basically it's not. I'm not doing this for shock value. I'm not finding a subject that I feel, wow, that's really dramatic. You know, and then kind of uh, go in and uh, just make a something about something that's very dramatic. I try to build something that is helpful and then has the building blocks to healing and recovery. And that's just a huge part of my work and and not try to just, uh, um, gosh, what is it? Just, just get a just lot show, of views, yeah. have a big audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so with that, the trauma work and the stages of moving through it, do you think that it kind of is, you know, clinically grounded in going through those same stages every single time to get to the other side? Is it formulaic in that way? Oh, no, 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 nothing's, nothing's completely formulaic, but it's in, formulaic isn't ne necessarily the right word. Mm -hmm. I, I believe in recovery that, and, and I'm a spiritual person, a spiritual man, I believe that we are built to recover in a certain way, that there's a certain arc to our recovery, much like we have a scratch or a, hmm. or a scrape or something, it, it heals over and we get the scab and then we have, it, there's a process. And I believe that process happens with recovery and grief recovery too, mm -hmm. and recovery from trauma. And so, yes, there, there is that repeatable kind of, I, I see that arc. Unfortunately, in today's society, that arc of recovery is stopped by so many different things that get in our way, and then it impedes it, then it becomes problematic. And that's, you know, it's it just halfway through our healing, we, we get too involved with whatever it is, and it, it becomes problematic. But, but there is a natural arc to that. And, but here, here's the amazing thing, because it, 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 that arc takes so many different modalities. It, it just, that arc, I've seen it be a, a pedal biker. A, a guy that lost his leg in Iraq has become a pedal biker. And that becomes his healing vehicle. And I see that arc happen around his racing and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a 9-11 survivor in our current film. And she's an artist. And I see that arc occur around her art. So, yes, there's definitely a pattern. And that's the beauty of it. Because... In my newest film, Unmasking Hope, I've taken that kind of diverse approach in that aggregate of different, it's even different traumas, not just one trauma, it's not just a disaster, it's not just veterans and war, it's 9-11, it's mass shootings, it's sexual assault, and I have my veteran, but that arc, even though, and, and the females, different ethnicities, different, you know, just very, very, very but the amazing thing is that arc is in that film and it's, but it's different modalities of healing and different people, different walks of life, different traumas, different, different grief, uh, grief paths, uh, paths. Eric, can you talk um, through a little bit what that arc, what components are part of that arc? You know, <laughs> the very, very beginning is, you know, obviously, I mean, we have the, we have the classic Kubler-Ross kind of, you know, grief arc, but basically in what I see, it's, you know, in, in the first, depending on what it is in the first few months, in the first year, it's just shock, hmm. you know, and that, and it just, and that's very, it, it's very interesting to interview somebody that is fresh out of something within that first three months is very, very difficult because it's just reaction. So once you get out of that, then it's a little bit of realization wow, this really did happen to me, but th it's not a grounded realization. It's just still floating and it's okay. You know, it's kind of, but one of the big, big marks in healing is when you run into somebody else at the similar circumstances and you're like, wow, me too. And then that's, that cracks everything open. Hmm. It's like, oh, okay. There's somebody else on this path that this happened to another mass shooting survivor and you know they go back into their own life and it's like all this crazy stuff and you're with people that completely don't understand because they don't have a point of reference and you finally get back and find somebody else you know it happened to you but you find somebody else and they're like 
oh my gosh, me too. And then you start connecting and you find out you do that. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm not crazy. You know, and then the light bulb goes on and hopefully that other individual that they meet has some sort of healing path. Oh, what are you doing? You know, can I get into that group? Then you get into a group. Hmm. Then and, and the group thing and the tribe is so important. And some people kind of do it solo. You know, you do need that realization of connecting. And and then it kind of starts to cement, wow, this really did happen to me. It happened to other people too. And that 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 uh that reality is so important in healing awesome. that you accept that and in my film in unmasking hope dr meet ekin out of stanford university he talks about a narrative a life narrative and how your life narrative is completely interrupted by this trauma mm. <clears throat> and we gradually rebuild our li our life narrative and so by connecting with others by starting to do these activities and healing activities we start to understand the truth of what happened to us and if we can really face that truth then we can start to incorporate it incorporate it into our life narrative and that's so crazy important hmm. to be able to say yeah this happened to me and it's part of me now it's not like let's push this away it didn't really happen i'm just going to shut up about it it has to kind of become incorporated in you and that's why uh <clears throat> going back to what what's important and what i see uh, you know, one of the big things in Unmasking Hope is going back to memorials and going back to the scene where it happened. And that just, it, it, it just cements a certain reality to it. And it opens up that door to start to say, you know, I was part of this, you know, this, and, and other people understand this. It's very important, you know, to have other people on board and even the outside world going to the 9-11 memorial with the two 9-11 survivors was really powerful because they they normally don't go down there and so to go there and have them see the public also be there still interested 20 years later it's like oh okay you know so these memorials anniversaries a big part and i can kind of go on and, but then the the art kind of continues and and through that you know thread they find other things that they can start to incorporate into their life, you know, and start to live again. Like Freddie, you know, the the um, Afghanistan bit, he, you know, he, he lost his leg and became a pedal biker. And then that became his thing. But it also became, oh, what? wow, you're a pedal biker. How did this happen? So he can talk about his story, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he became one of the top pedal bikers. So that kind of thread and that whole understanding and all these things start to fit in to and 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 it happens and it plays out for a veteran it plays out for a 9-11 survivor it plays out for a mass shooting survivor and i've had the honor of being there to be able to go back to some of these memorials with them and to witness witness this whole this whole healing so to me um that part of this thing is overpaid and oh by the way i'm making a movie <laughs> mm -hmm. so. I I like uh, everything that you have to say, but I like how you um made that analogy with a wound that you can see on the outside because that makes a lot of sense to me of healing from a medical standpoint. But of course, why wouldn't that happen with anything social or otherwise? Uh, I'm curious too. When you made that first film, was that your healing tool? Oh, see, that's a whole nother thing. It, it, every time it's, it's part of my process and, and for, for facing the fire in particular on the other side of the camera, for me, it was huge mm -hmm. and it was huge. That was the first realization that, you know, when we had the screening and gosh, I can't believe how quickly I got that movie done. It takes me years now. We got it done in time for the first anniversary of the fire oh, and to see wow. the community and to see the people and the people involved in the film and people that have lost their homes see see their stories reflected for me that was that was it i'm like this is what i do this is my calling because and it's it's gotten 
it's gotten bigger and bigger each time each film grows and the mm. audience grows and for unmasking hope we you know we're hoping for a, a very big release searching for home coming back for more was aired 2300 times on public television and and uh I was talking to my distributor, public television distributor, and we were under the gun to get that thing out. We we only had like a month to get it out. You know, I mean, it took eight years to make, but a month. To, this time, you know, we're finishing the film and we have over three months to prepare and 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 you know do the do the front work to make sure that this next film has a you know a huge audience. But that's where that's where I get kind of my pay i guess you would say mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. but it's interesting let me rewind real quick <clears throat> you know the scratch analogy and the and the open wound analogy you know the the, the conundrum or the catch 22 or, or whatever you want to say that uh, about that open wound is these wounds that we're talking about you can't see mm -hmm. so it's like it's very difficult for somebody to explain to their mom to their has been even to the closest ones to them, you know, I'm kind of broken, mm -hmm. but they don't see it, you know, and that's where the mask, unmasking hope, mm -hmm. you know, that mask that we put on is very functional in hiding ourselves and our brokenness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talk about in unmasking hope is like taking that mask off, getting that mask off. So we can, we can start people who we are and start to rebuild our narrative. That's really powerful. Have you considered doing a follow-up film for your own trauma, The Fire? Just curious if that's ever occurred to you. You know, I thought about it, but, you know, I, it's everybody says I should put my story into my film, but I do. But it's just through everybody else's words. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I just, uh, I have my personal recovery, too. You know, after that fire over th 30 years ago, I got clean and sober and and through the grace of God and the group I belong to, I haven't seen fit to have to use drugs or alcohol again since then. And so I understand recovery and that's my personal thing. And I kind of live it every day. I do live it every day because I have to. Yeah. So um, that's kind of, I don't know, That's that's what I get to do. I get to be sober another day and continue to carry the message. Do you still stay in touch with um, other victims of the fire back then? Oh, you're frozen, Eric. Hopefully it'll shake loose soon. And that uh, hopefully help. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I can hear you now. Sorry, okay. did you hear my question? Yeah, do I stay in contact? Yeah. You know, gosh, a lot of those people have passed away and... It's a long time ago. Yeah. And well, I, how I, old actually, were you when that happened? Roughly. You don't have to be. Oh, no, no, that's OK. I mean, it was the fire was 32 years ago. So I was around 27 years old. Oh, you were very young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how did this happen? 59 years old. I'm like, where did this this white beard? Where did this come from? But yeah. <laughs> I feel that way every morning as well. Not the beard specifically. But, but you know, the neat thing about that comes, you know, it does come it comes wisdom. And, you know, I went to California Institute of the Arts in um, in the 80s. And, and there was quite a lineup of extremely talented artists there. And one of my teachers once said, you know, here, here you are right now, and here's your vision. And as a young artist, you know, it's, you're like, okay, this is my vision of what I want to do. And I'm over here, you know, and it's like, he goes, if you keep doing it and you keep doing it soon, it almost overlaps. And mm -hmm. that's true. My vision of what Unmasking Hope would be is very, very close to what it is. As opposed to when way back when I did face in the fire, it, it was kind of out of control. <laughs> it's like trying to keep this crazy thing just, you know, it won an Emmy Award. I guess it was good, but you know, um, but you know, time, time, and and time, it, you know, time helps us incorporate our our wounds and our 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 recovery. It's it's time is a huge huge factor in all that. So, um. You know, are that's you, why we celebrate anniversaries and things. Are you still in California? 
Yes, I am. And I'll never ever leave. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I was born and bred California and uh, I love the ocean and my wife and I, the kids are all out of the house and my wife and I moved back out to the beach. So we moved inland mm -hmm. for a while, raised the kids and now we're back out in our super secret love shack out here. <laughs> are you in Santa Barbara still? No, I'm in, I'm down in Oxnard. I'm afraid we're a little bit priced out of Santa Barbara. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I live in Mount Shasta. Oh, okay. And That's we're beautiful up there. It's beautiful. We've been having a lot of fires, speaking of fire. And oh I my gosh, in, that's crazy. I work in primary care and a lot of my patients have had homes destroyed. And just recently we had this fire on the Klamath River. And I a number of my patients have been impacted and a whole town almost burned to the ground. So you know that that's that's just really, you know, when 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 my home burned in the Pancake Fire disaster, we had about 450 structures or so, only one death, and it was at the point at that time it was one of the biggest. Uh, where, where I can't remember. There's a name for it. Um, you know, urban interface fires or something because it comes down through the uh, the foothills and stuff, and then. A few years later, Oakland happened, and there was over a thousand, eleven hundred homes or more, and there was, I think, dozens of deaths, and so that just that was devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. How could it even get worse? And every time it seems to get worse. I mean, I just can't believe, you know, paradise, and then those fires that you're talking about. Oh, it just yeah. the magnitude is so. Um intense you know and it, you know the the interesting thing about the about the people you know there there are a certain amount of people in every kind of demographic population sampling especially older people like the older people in, Par uh, in paradise mm -hmm. that they don't recover mm -hmm. it's the beginning of entropy it's the last straw and it's very difficult to overcome Mm -hmm. you know so that's a lot of tragedy that's a lot that's very tough mm -hmm. you know and and then there's the people that, that were like my age 27 i was really overcome and god gave me a lot of strength to do that and and i move ahead whereas um the older people it's very difficult right to rebuild and stuff especially when you're on the other side of 60 70 and here i am <laughs> <laughs> getting there but but anyways i i feel for those people oh. and, and those communities um it sounds like sense. oh sorry john you go ahead i was just going to ask a really um idiosyncratic question that makes me wonder like what are the ages of the folks that you feature in your films are these young people middle-aged people a range of folks it's a big range yeah um unmasking hope doesn't have a huge range we have jack delaney who was a first responder for 9-11 and i'm not sure how old he is now um we have some younger people from the mass shootings but uh, there was a big range in my film searching for home coming back from war a world war ii veteran that was a tail gunner benny jeffries mm -hmm. um to we had apache J who was an Iraqi vet and he was in his 20s. So we had a huge range in yeah. that. And uh, what's interesting is, you know, in in Searching for Home, we had a gentleman, his nickname was Fat Cowboy. And uh, <laughs> he was a Korean Purple Heart uh, Marine veteran. And uh, he, he didn't even know he had PTSD for... I don't know how many years and it was like diagnosed almost 40 to 50 years later. Oh, wow. And then he was able to look at his life and he, he was, he, he made it happen. You know, he has a great family and everything, but then it was like an aha moment. Oh, that's what happened. But then at the end, that part of his life, it gave him so much more meaning mm. because he was able to help these young guys coming home and say, you know, I've been there and don't wait. 40 years to get help so you know it's, what great stories i i'm able to be around and it's fun to tell them and share them with you <laughs> so in a situation like him when you're talking about unmasking 
was he, it's like he had a mask on and he never even knew it was there he had no idea why he would react and act out the way he was and uh you know and so finally when they said yeah ptsd and and that and that generation is like no i don't have ptsd it's like, nope you know you're you that's that's a fancy thing you know it's like nope not that and then you know then the slow realization and you know his heart his heart heart opened up and he said yeah hmm. it, it makes sense you know and and him and his wife they raised i don't know how many kids and they're all great people the johnsons in the in kansas and they're they're they became good friends and uh but uh you know it was big realization but he was able to at the end of his life kind of make a lot out of out of it by helping others hmm. so that's a key factor and you know that's when, when i see a survivor um or anybody in recovery any sort of recovery when you start to help others that's when your uh that's when your recovery really starts to take off hmm. there's certain points that are just <laughs> rocket ships and uh, when you help other people that's a big point we are social creatures for sure mm-hmm Eric, how do stories find their way to you? Like which which stories do you, how do you choose what to make the next film about? You know, that's a, that's a really interesting um, question. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, you know, my work and I'm spirit, a spiritually based person, you know, they're, God's my producer and it's, it, I don't like even apologizing for it anymore because it's not crazy to me. The right people are drawn to the project and, and the right people end up in the project, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, and I have to make some tough decisions, but sometimes, you know, even in those tough decisions, I just know I'm being led. And uh, with this current film, you know, we, we did a lot of production in um, Kansas and everything. And then, I'm trying to cut the film together and until I let every all the stuff we did in Kansas go, the film didn't cut. It wasn't it wasn't working. And so there's tough decisions and I'm led into everything. But to answer that question, it's it's kind of uh it's it, it it's led to me. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a spiritual process for me because God's kind of in control of this. And uh and it's just, it, it becomes a way that I work, you know, because there's certain things that happen in the production. I can't explain how this happened or how this might have come about. And uh, so, you know, that's the answer to that. And uh, and I'm super, I hate when people say hashtag blessed, but I'm super blessed <laughs> that the p i find the people i find and then they you know uh, you mentioned are a lot of people you know are these people my friends from facing the fire i don't have a lot of friends i i do have friends that go all the way back to my other film um homecoming of vietnam vets journey i have a lot of friends from searching for home and uh and i have friends that are going to be lifelong friends from unmasking hope and uh, these people it's just they're we just connect and we you know after after we went to the um took heidi and molly to the uh um the memorial gardens in um las vegas for the route 91 shooting you know that was a very special time with them and i and i was invited to heidi's wedding just a couple months ago you know my wife and i got to go and share with her and meet her her husband and (laughs) i was gonna say fiance but it's just, it, yeah, it's it, it's amazing how the tapestry gets, mm-hmm. you know, all woven mm-hmm. together. And and then I get to make a movie too, so. That's amazing. I, I sort of have a fantasy that in another life trajectory, I'm a documentary filmmaker. <laughs> but with, well, in this life, I have no skills, no... <laughs> No leads in, nothing like that. But it it's always intrigued me as an art form and education tool. Um, do you teach or off? You know, do you offer any overt efforts to mentor filmmakers informally, formally? I'm just you know, I, 
I'm open to that, but you know, it's, it's interesting because I haven't found really anybody that, you know, that connects that way. You know, I would love to do that. And I did that with, you know, with my mentors when I was learning, you know, actually it was in more commercial film. Like, and, you know, my wife says, always says, oh, you should teach, but I'm more, I'm more interested in not teaching so much the documentary thing, but I'm interested in interacting with people. And, and what I really do well is, um, uh, you know, is supply empathy and connect with people, hear their story and, and become a support system. You know, I mean, one of my, one of my biggest, uh, I'm just so proud of the fact that I was able to walk the, and and it was part of my films, but it's beyond my films. I was able to part uh, walk the wall in Washington D.C., the Vietnam Memorial, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, with of with several veterans that I went back to the wall with. I was able to go to the 9/11 Memorial with Jack Delaney and Becky Lazinger, and I was able to go to the Memorial Gardens for the Route 91 shooting in Las Vegas with Heidi and Molly. And, you know, um, that's what I do. I like doing that. Teaching would be great. And and I know a lot of technique and, and a lot of stuff. But gosh, that's, that's the thing I'm going to keep doing, you know, is connecting and accompanying and, and, and supporting. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you are helping people integrate with their traumas as well. And with that, have you learned some skills that you could pass on to others um, in terms of sitting with people who have been affected by trauma and being there for them? So from from the side of kind of like, I, for lack of a better word, from the caregiver kind of side, from the friend side? I guess or either from, or. From the survivor side. Oh, I well, kind of from, mean from, from a caregiver friend, yeah. Yeah, from both, like the, interesting. yeah, from the significant other loved one side, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is listen. And you don't have to say anything. You know, I've talked a lot. And unfortunately, it didn't make it into the film. But I talked to Dr. Meet Ekin and Dr. Catherine Shear out of Columbia University. She's a grief expert about a concept called holding space. It's It's being able to connect and become transparent and listen. The fine art of it's listening is listening. The word has gotten cheapened. People don't listen anymore. You know, it's like you wait for, okay, when I do, I get, okay, I get to talk now. <laughs> you know, it's like it, they're being able to really connect with somebody and not worry about what you're going to say next and really hear and, and empathize. That's what it is imagine put yourself into their shoes when they're talking and, and make eye contact and make physical contact you know hand on the shoulder means a lot you know and you don't have to say anything and you know it, there's the big no-nos of like oh i understand no you don't understand <laughs> but you can say hey i hear what you're saying you know and it's just like and and just saying oh, well it could have been worse no <laughs> please don't say that you know there's all sorts of why don't you just get over it is a classic one but but just holding space and being able to be present for somebody you know and and it, it's practice not it might not even be the first time it, it's practice in in time and time again with the individual that's been affected by grief or trauma you know it's very difficult it's very difficult to go to the hospital with somebody that's going to die Mm -hmm. you know it's very difficult to be with somebody that just lost somebody what do you say but you know what the best thing you can do is just be there and just and just you know go get a sandwich <laughs> you know it, it's that simple people complicate that whole thing so from that side that's one of the most important things one of the most important things you can do from the other side of the being the survivor mm -hmm. You got to seek out somebody else. Hmm. You got to, you got to talk about it. You got to find somebody safe and preferably somebody that's been through something similar, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the veterans, one of the biggest problems, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't rip the VA. I don't, it, it, 
it the VA has a lot of angels in it. And um, but unfortunately, it's it's so big, it has to be bureaucratic. But where I'm going with this is there's a lot of stories about veterans going to counselors there and the counselors don't have any connection to the veterans. You know, that's why we chose um, on my last film, 877 War Vets as a number and organization in the vet centers because veteran to veteran. So you can find somebody else that's been there, Mm -hmm. you know, and so it's so important to find somebody else. You know, if you if you're grieving, you lost your husband, you lost a loved one, you lost your God forbid your child, seek out a group. There's other people going through exactly what you're you're going through. You know, and those are those are two the key things that you can do on on both sides of the fence, I guess you would say. And in a rural location, like I'm in a pretty rural area. You could find maybe those groups online as opposed to in person through the internet, I'm guessing. Oh, totally. And that's that's a neat thing too. You know, it's like, I know for my recovery groups, you know, when we went into lockdown and that whole crazy thing, uh-huh. you know, we we all went to Zoom. And, and the Zoom meetings aren't 100% like being there and getting a hug. Mm-hmm. But you know what? If that's all you got, it's going to work pretty well. So, you know, that's very important to, and yeah, the internet and Zoom and, and uh, reaching out that way is, you know, there's groups all over the place now. Hmm. Eric, I want to make sure that you let people know um, who are watching how they can find you and find out more about what you're doing. Well, one of the best ways is, you know, to go to ecproductions.com. Um, and then uh, the other the other way to find out what's going with um, Unmasking Hope is to go to unmaskinghopethemovie.com. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you know why I'm laughing is I have somebody that does all my social media. I've gotten off social media about three or four months ago, and I think... For my mental health, it's probably one of the best things I've ever done. So I'd love to go, hey, see my Twitter and everything, but I can't do that. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm way healthier now that I'm on social media. It's but, a little but, bit but, of uh, a catch-22, isn't it? I yeah, know. But you can I, find... I remain connected for very specific reasons, but um I could use a, a detox from social media for sure. <laughs> you know, and that's what was so nice. I could be connected with all the people from my films and stuff, but I got to tell you that it, it, oh man, this is a whole different show. But, you know, for me and Facebook, it, I, I, I dropped it because I thought it was a time waster, which it was. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden I noticed when I go to the beach with my family, oh, where are we going to get our shot? you know and so i'm at the beach looking for a selfie at a moment instead of going to the beach with my family and then all of a sudden i realize that i'm seeking this like validation from people that really i don't even know mm-hmm. and so i just kind of stopped that <laughs> and then all of a sudden i realize i'm taking pictures now because i want to remember this moment my son's birthday we went to dinner this weekend I'm taking pictures because I want to remember what my, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to remember what my boys look like. And I want to remember, and it's in, now it's in between. It's not in between me and Facebook and like getting a selfie. It's in between my sons and I and my wife and God. And that, and and that's what my life is. I'm like, oh, that's what he meant me to do. So anyways, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off that <laughs> social media, but but unmasking hope is on Instagram and Facebook and and the so you just uh look for unmasking hope and and so we have our social media <laughs> but I don't even check it. No, that's <laughs> smart. Because <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm looking at everything else. I'm like, oh, they went where? Why? I should be doing. And I'm like, don't need that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One thing about social media I've been noticing is it's a lot of advertisement. 
Mm -hmm. like it's not even the stuff that you go there to see. It's a lot of trying to sell you. I don't know, attention spans, right? People are so competing for one another's attention, which is this whole bizarre commodity these days. Oh my gosh. You know, it's just the realization that everything is monetized and mm -hmm. from pharmaceuticals and your health to social media, everything is monetized. How can we get the buck? And it's just like, like wow. Okay. You know, it's like, uh, I just, <laughs> I was gonna, I'm just laughing. I need to monetize my films a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank God, thank God we have a very successful real estate business because <laughs> Mm -hmm. it, it keeps me it keeps me in the studio during these times and my and i have a great partner my wife is an amazing you know we, her and i are uh we're partners and everything we're perfect par parenting partners so far so good on the kids knock on wood and so That's far amazing. So good on i'm parents. impressed with that yeah <laughs> dream team yeah. you guys are the dream team yeah you know it's 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. We're coming up on 30 years um, next June, so. Congratulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. one thing I, I want to mention about trauma, being a medical yeah. provider, I've seen some pretty interesting health issues disappear when people get through their traumas. Um, you know, real very specific ones that you can make objective like um, autoimmune diseases that will just go into remission or even arrhythmias, heart uh, irregularities. And, um, you know, there's one that's really well documented. It's called Takasubo myocarditis. And you can uh -huh. um, basically your heart can fail because someone that you love has died. And uh, wow. it's, it's one of the most extreme ones, but it's been very well documented. And occasionally you'll find someone in heart failure and it turns out that they had a loved one die. And, and every time it's this, so it ha must have to do with the chemicals that are released during a traumatic event. Um, but I don't know. I find that pretty fascinating and I see it a lot uh, also where people will be in abusive relationships and then I see them every week and then I don't see them for like a year and a half and they come back in. I'm like, I haven't seen you in forever. What's going on? And they'll tell me, oh, I ended up getting a divorce and all my medical problems resolved. <laughs> you know, that it is amazing. I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking over here because I just want to make sure I'm giving the right name to this. So hold on. Here we go. The body keeps score. And okay. We love what a, what a amazing <laughs> book. You know, and it, it's just like people do not the eight inches in between here or six inches, whatever it is, it, it just people don't give that enough. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, power or whatever. It is. Yeah. Because you know, it, it just it it just so but the problem is, you know, it's like you can't think certain things away, you know, and that's, and you can't, it, it just, there's certain things we're going to need help with. And it goes back to like what we were talking about earlier about getting help and about there's certain things that we need help and we need help resolving the trauma and stuff. And then, then all of a sudden our body starts to operate differently mm -hmm. because, you know, we, we, we just, you know, um, there's I, I hate calling them triggers i, I was talking to uh uh dr uh sheer out of um columbia university and she doesn't like to use triggers it's active activating activations and and uh but certain things activate you and you don't and, and you have no control over that mm -hmm. you know and and you have to get to the core of that and part of that just takes time and part of that makes is rewriting your narrative part of that is like looking at the truth of like what really happened part of that you know it's it's a big process things don't clear up you know it's not just going through the drive through and getting your dinner within five minutes <laughs> you know? it, it, it takes a long time we we talked with a physician two weeks ago who does a lot of bit changing addictive behaviors chronic pain 
Um, and he was saying one of the most successful things to get people to make a shift is a change in their paradigm. And if you think about it, a traumatic event is a change in your paradigm. It's instant. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Your whole world is shifted. So then how do we do that to get people closer to the integration, right? How do you get those paradigm shifts where you reintegrate and you become whole and your heart opens? And I mean, that might be part of what you're discussing with taking off the mask. You know, and it, it just, again, it's, it's a big process and it's, as, you know, it's in, in, in where I come from, in my recovery from drugs and alcohol, we need a spirit for me. I needed a spiritual shift sufficient in force to to completely change me so I think differently. And it's exactly what you're talking about, a paradigm shift. For me, it had to be a, it was of a spiritual nature. I had a spiritual malady at the core, and I still do. I have to work on it every day. Mm. But it 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 I needed a spiritual shift of of great magnitude to be able to overcome my my alcoholism i'm still alcoholic it's still sitting there waiting for me if i if i let up but i needed a shift a paradigm shift and my paradigm shift came as a spiritual um a spiritual shift and i think social support is a key piece too as oh and that's part of the about. maintenance yeah. no doubt my meetings and, and being able to be with my tribe is is huge you know I, I'm 31 years sober and I, I still go to two meetings a week at least mm. and people are like aren't you done with that yet I'm like oh, I don't <laughs> want to be works. it's not yeah. going to be good you know, but then but you get to a certain point where you want to mm. you know because you can you you're bringing something to the party instead of just taking away got it so you're helping <laughs> other people too oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. really, it's frustrating, but it's also fun. Did you have religion before you decided to get sober? Yeah. You know, I, I religion is one thing that spirituality is something else. Mm. Oh, okay. You know, um, it's it. for me, it's, it's yeah. interesting. What did they say? What, let me, let me make sure I get this right. Um, religion is for people that want to go to heaven and spirituality is for people that have been to hell. Is that it? <laughs> That's a good quote. <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. That's pretty good. <laughs> so I think I'm paraphrasing. Somebody might write, no, he had it wrong. But, um, you know, uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I've grown up surfing my whole life. I started surfing when I was eight years old. And so, you know, uh, being out in the water and being connected with nature is a huge part for me and and seeing that there is a grand design to everything you know and uh and then being able to open my mind up enough to know that people that are religious mm -hmm. do have a lot of very important tools and a lot of very important beliefs you know i don't shut my mind to anything you know and uh you know, that's why I go to church, you know, and, um, and, you know, I have a personal relationship with my creator and, uh, that that's the most important part. And, uh, I try to, I try to, you know, make sure that, uh, that's in good working order every day. <laughs> and with your films and dealing and, um, learning from other trauma survivors, do you find that everyone has something similar? Like you were saying, a gentleman had his biking and another woman, her art. And do you feel like in order to transition through and integrate as whole again, you need to have something that is that important to you, like a guiding kind of thing to hold on to? I, I believe so. And I also believe God, you know, even if you don't believe in God, God's still got your back. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think he's like, I think he's beyond what we can even imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think, yes, I, everybody needs their modality. I love that word, a modality, you know, and uh, they need their, they need their shtick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need their gig. 
you know, and, and, you know, for some people, as I said, it's, it's, it's pedal biking for some people. And for like Jack Delaney, uh, the 9-11 first responder, it's, it's uh, uh, helping others and being uh, pretty much a, you know, a, a patriarch to uh, a lot of, a lot of people and, and to this, the families of the men that were lost that day. And that's part of his healing. And so, it, yeah, it takes very many forms, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and I, I just think God's a grand orchestrator of these things. And he, he just puts everything together in such a way that, you know, if you're willing to participate, you're, he, he can, we're I, one of my readings this morning was just about how, how to turn tragedy into, uh, into gold, you know, so. You know, he has a way of doing that if you want to participate. And you've done that. It sounds like that experience that happened to you at 27 put your world on a beautiful path that it wasn't on before, right? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's it, it's interesting to, you know, to look at, you know, my career and my work and, it definitely hasn't been the economic mechanism, but then again, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine about the two different economies, you know, there's, there's a spiritual God's economy, which is operates on a whole different kind of system. Then there's the world's economy. And so when we're like tr- applying the world's economy to some of our service work, it doesn't, it doesn't pan out too well. Does it? It's like, wait, hold on. That's not, you know, but when you look at God's economy, it's like, you know, it says in the Bible, you know, it's like, you know, store up in, you know, store up in heaven, you know, all the good for yourself. And it's just like not on earth. And that means, you know, doing good for others. So. Right. Well, and what is wealth? That's a whole other question. Mm-hmm. De- it depends on you and <laughs> what you oh, yeah. brings you wealth, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it, 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 everything is just so subjective that way, mm, totally. you know, and, and that's something else I've learned, you know, about trauma is, you know, we, we, I can't, I can't judge your trauma, mm-hmm. you know, it's just like, and, and that's something that, you know, Becky in, in, in uh, the nine eleven survivor in the film, you know, she's like, well, I didn't even really get hurt but there's other people that got killed, you know, and it's like, then she's people and all, and it's like, and it's soldiers. Well, you know, I didn't lose a leg. I have a that, you know, it, 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 you can't quantify mm-hmm. or qualify your trauma. Mm-hmm. Your trauma is your trauma for yourself. It's about you, mm-hmm. you know, and we can't judge that. Mm-hmm. So it's same with your recovery, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, um, that's why I learned about helping other guys, you know, in, in drug and alcohol recovery. You know, I can't, I can't necessarily, I can help them along their path, but I can't judge their path. So. And like you said, understand it. You can just empathize and be with them. Mm-hmm. You can't understand how they feel. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing your film. Um, can you tell us again where we can find it for people who are listening? So on Instagram and Facebook, and uh, you can look Unmasking Hope, mm-hmm. and then for uh, you can go to our website unmaskinghopethemovie.com, and, and uh, we're going to be releasing on public television in uh, the end of January, the beginning of next year, so we can ramp this thing up and uh, ask your local public television station if uh, they're going to be airing Unmasking Hope, and okay, uh, that would be awesome. Great. We will do that. Are there places people can find your um, existing films? Are they available to watch anywhere? Yeah. If you Google searching, searching for home, um, coming back from war, uh, it's available on Pluto. I believe we're still on Apple TV and a bunch of, and actually I just had a call. We're renewing all those too. So oh, that's great. Uh, searching for home, coming back from war will be, is still out there. Homecoming of Vietnam Vets Journey is just sitting I got to get it, get it posted, but you can also go to YouTube and Google. Um, I, I think it's US, UCSB presents Faces in the Fire, and uh, you can okay. see Faces in the Fire on YouTube. Terrific. That's Thank good. you so much for your work. Yeah. 
Thank you. And this has been fun chatting away. Yeah, for us too. Thank for you so much. Well. Great. Thank it's you. Great pleasure to meet you, Eric. Thank you for your time today. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions that you want to ask us? <clears throat> um, you know, just just I, I just ask anybody that's listening, take a second to listen to somebody else and empathize today. Uh-huh. And, and don't worry about what you're gonna say next. <laughs> Because actually, it's a lot easier not to worry about what you're going to say next. It's true, yeah. <laughs> because uh, I think the fine art of listening has completely gone out the window. Mm -hmm. I, I love it when I meet a young person. Well, with my kids, my, they're not my kids. Twenty four and twenty three and twenty. Feel your kids. But when they when they bring their friends home, it's yeah. interesting. Some kids, man, you you'll talk to them and they just. Shh. But then other kids that. Uh, they they really connect and it's just it, it, it's it's just um I, not too many of them, you know and uh it, it's just uh it, it's really um it's really a gift to be a good listener and you're giving somebody else a gift and what i'm saying is that that art's been lost so listen to somebody today and actually look them in the eyes and not worry about what you're going to say next that's all i have to say <laughs> i like that a lot I heard a quote that you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, this um, this has been Two Sisters Health, and this is Eric Christensen, um, document uh, documentary filmmaker and really spiritual healer, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Okay, bye-bye.